Hello, welcome back. We're going to do some basic ideas on confidence intervals. We'll start to actually, this is just conceptually getting to the idea. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the formality in other lectures. But this is just to get the basics of confidence intervals, what we're actually talking about, kind of looking at it for the population and what we'll look at for the top possible samples as we go later on. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is lecture 4B, confidence interval. I'm going to start with a demonstration about a box of gears. And this special box of gears, one of the things we need to realize, this is a special box of gears. And the fact that these are the only gears that exist. Meaning we are talking about the population. And there's going to be a small population. Actually, the population is so small that the population is only five. So big N is equal to five. There's only these five possible gears. There's a known population mean, right? So we have these five special gears. These are the only gears in the world. They have different diameters. There's a known for sure population mean for this. And we're gonna do a sample of one. So what we, again, what we've done, we have an N population is five. I'm going to little n one. I'm going to select one of those. And I have five different ways I could sample those, right? So remember we talked about that. The number of ways to sample this is five choose one. Five choose one is, is five. So there's five possible ways I could do this. And of those five possible ways, I would I could take those each one and I could calculate the average of my sample of one. Which is really kind of easy because x bar is equal to x over oh, my sum of x over my little n. So I'm going to basically get x over one. And so the actual value I get, right? And so of those possibilities, I have five possible ways that I could write this down. And so each one of those five have those these five possibilities. I can only choose one of the, each one of those. If I were to build a confidence interval, because I really want to know what this is. And if I took each one of those and I made these little wings, these little uh, TIE fighter wing ideas, and I need to know, I need to increase the, con the width of these things until 60% of them cross this line, the actual include include the actual population interval. So this, if I use an example of the 60th percent of confidence intervals, how wide do I need to make these wings so that at least 60% of the samples with their intervals capture the actual population? Right, that's what we're talking about. So if I wanted 70% confidence intervals, how wide do I need to make these to make them 70? If I wanted a 10% confidence interval, how wide do I need to make them so that only 10% of them catch it? And so if I want lower confidence intervals, like let's 40, say 40%, I don't need to have all of them cash, so I only need 40%, I could actually use smaller wings. Likewise, if I want a higher confidence interval, I would require wider wings. And 100% confidence interval would have to make the wings big enough that I could actually capture, every single sample would always capture that. So I could make, let's just kind of do this for giggles, let's say this was the 100% confidence interval, I would have to make these wings so big that each one of them actually could just capture and that same distance, right? The same distance has to be applied to all of them, right? Because it's a constant. I don't know which sample I'm going to get. So let's figure out which one's going to be the longest one. So the furthest one away looks like this one. He's going to need confidence intervals at least this big on either side to be able to capture what's going on. So then I have to draw that same width on each one of these to be able to capture that. Now, not very useful when I say, hey, I'm gonna sample here, and I could potentially, if I know I'm plus or minus humongous, I guarantee I've got this in there, right? Not very useful at 100% confidence interval. They're actually huge, right? So I don't wanna do that. So I need to find some confidence interval that's gonna be acceptable to me. So that's only if I had a small n of one. Well, what if I did two? 
right? So again, I'm going to go back to my little rule, right? So I've got five, choose two. It does not matter which order, right? Order does not matter. Order does not matter. I don't care. That reminds us that we want five, choose two, which is the binomial, and that is 10. So there's 10 possible ways I could take two gears out of that population without replacement. Without replacement. That's key. All right, so I can get the red one and the orange one, the red one and the blue one, red one and the green one, and so on and so on and so forth. Remember, the order doesn't matter. I could take the averages, so I'm calculating little x bars. That's what all this is all about. And then I'm plotting those x bars. Now, notice I have more of them. And as I increase, I get smaller wings if I increase the sample size, right? So I still have 10 of these. One, two, three, four of them still. These are still 60th confidence intervals. But I have many more samples, right? So I've got a sample size, a little n of two, right? Which I also get a whole lot more possibilities, right? So in this case, I have 10 possibilities. Four of them are crossing, are getting beamed by the tractor beam of the population mean or including the population mean. So it's a 60% confidence interval. So the interval is actually this distance, which is the same. And this distance is the confidence interval. And when I say 60% is how wide do I need to make this in order for 60% of all the possible samples that I could possibly make would actually contain the population average. Likewise, if we move up, there I've got three. So I've got an N choose three. I've got a five choose three situation. So there's 10 ways to do that. The wings get even smaller because notice how they're tightening. They're tightening in here, right? They're getting closer and closer. These are X bars for each sample. I'm plotting X bars and I'm plotting each of the samples and putting their confidence intervals. They're getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And then if I go down a sample, so five, choose four. There's five ways to do that. And notice how they're getting really close in here, right? They're really getting tight around this, at this average. And here's again the X bars. And then lastly, if I sampled five, choose five, there's only one way to do that. I've actually sampled the entire population. Bam, I nail it, right? But I sampled the whole population, which is very, very unrealistic. Right, so this is just a this is a thought experiment. There's no way you're ever gonna do that. Because I'm 100% confident that population mean is the sample mean. It has to be, right? That's what I meant. I, pop I, literally, saw I literally sampled everything. Right, I'm literally calculating the sum of X's over big N, right? And that's mu, right? In reality, my X bar is the sum of X over little N. At this point, N is equal to N. So my mu and my X bar have to be the same thing, right? So that's the idea. Now, the idea, reality is you're never going to have just five gears. You're never going to be able to sample all of them. But we're making the assumption that if I had something... I'm going to sample the population and I'm going to be sampling randomly from this. And I'm gonna look at all the possible ways that I could have possibly picked this out from a huge universe. And we're going back to that central limit theorem we talked about in the last lecture. They're gonna to try to follow that normal distribution around mu, right? So these confidence intervals are gonna be key because what I do is I take a sample, I plus and minus a confidence interval, and I say that at that point, I know that inside here is mu inside that interval sometimes, you know, if I said 60% confidence interval means 60% of all the possible ways I could have done this, they would include mu, right? So that's what I'm basically saying is of all the possible ways I could sample it with this confidence interval, 60% of all those possibilities would actually contain the population, the real population. How are we going to use that? Well, confidence intervals, we just kind of made them up there. We're going to actually have to make them up by understanding how big of an error we think we're going to make. So when we're doing that, we need to talk about the standard error because we don't really know what the mean was and we don't know really how much, how far off are we. We don't get this beautiful situation like we did with the gears. So what we do is we kind of make some assumptions. We start off with the assumption that we got the variability of the test. So we got the variance from our sample. So how messed up is our sample? 
The more messed up our sample is, the bigger the error. And we also have to say, you know, how many data points did I use? All right, so our big sample, this actually shouldn't be in, this should be a little in, right? And we're gonna call the ratio of the variance from our sample, right, or variability in our sample over the square root of how many sample size, we're gonna call that what's called a standard error. And we're gonna use that particular feature to build our confidence intervals. So that's saying is how messed up is our data? Is data. And how much data did we collect? We're in control of this. Well, we're in control of this part. Life is in control of this part. Us, life, it's just the way it is. This is us. We're in control of how much data we can have. And what we're gonna do is now we need to know how ignorant we are. That's how much ignorant. The question is we also need to know how much risk we're gonna take. So we scale up this risk by using what's called a z-score concept from the very first week of class. And we're not sure which side we're gonna make a mistake on because we don't really know. So we have this concept of P, which is our confidence level. So how much risk do we wanna take? Usually for our purposes for engineering, we're gonna use 95 or 90. Now we can actually calculate our confidence intervals. Remember the other lecture, right? That's what, or the beginning of this lecture, that's what it was all about. And so how we're gonna do that is here's that standard error. This is ignorance, and this is risk. And so we're going to get this risk factor that's going to, and that's actually going to be Z from our normal distribution curves. And where do we get those from? We get them from the, the Gaussian distribution, or more on that later in another section. We get these values from the textbooks, or if you're using R, you can get them with these functions. Other systems have different functions to calculate those all. Well, book publishers publish a whole big of them. There's only a few that are ever used, and you're going to get to know them and recognize them by sight, right? But you're going to use these and find these special Zs to give us our risk tolerance of how off we want to be. So when we start talking about confidence intervals later on in our hypothesis testing, this is the concept we're talking about. We're saying, I get a sample. It's at X bar. How big do I need to make these wings to give me some level of confidence? Well, that's based on how screwed up the data is. How much data did I collect? That's gonna be our, S, our standard error. And then we're gonna multiply that by our Z for a given a confidence interval, one minus P confidence interval over two. If you don't know which side it's on, this is our risk. And that value there will give us how wide does this need to be? And we're gonna use that width to help us make some engineering decisions. And that's what we're gonna do in the next couple of lectures. Hopefully that gets you a big idea on what's going on with the confidence intervals and what we're talking about those confidence intervals. And we'll see how that applies in the next upcoming lectures. Thanks a lot.